Yeah, so this, this is utility scale. I don't see a customer owned uh, PV solar option. Because they're not really something that you would be buying. Uh, yeah. But it seems like the promotion of those could be a cost that could be figured in mm -hmm. here. Um, you know, things like um, what's it, the Go Solar or the Solar Express plan, Puget uh, Sound Energy, that has, I'm sure, some costs associated with it to encourage people to install yeah. solar locally. Do you think that wasn't included just because they didn't think there was enough of it yet? Or? Yeah, I think it's really the way we get because PSE, our, our green power programs, our renewable energy programs are separate from our energy efficiency programs. And a lot of that is just the, the accounting and the rate structure. We have a conservation, basically all of our energy efficiency programs are rate payer funded. So we have a conservation rider on, on, our, um, on our bill. That's what customers pay into, and then all of that funding is basically by by legislation has to go back into energy efficiency. And then on the renewable side, you know, there's a lot of state credits around that. Uh, there's the net metering. You know, that's all yeah. a separate bucket than the energy efficiency. It's almost legislatively driven that those things are separated out, even though yeah. if you were looking at a chart like this, it would make a lot of sense to put those in the same bucket. So I, uh, I talked about a little bit, so this is just a, a summary of that. Um, you know, utilities with customers of 25,000 or utilities with 25,000 or more customers must obtain 15% of their electricity from renewable resources by 2020 and undertake all cost effective energy conservation. And you know, this is really about you know, renew renewable sustainable energy. We were talking about the hydro system earlier. Hydro generation doesn't count. What does count is if we do upgrades at hydro facilities that increase your, your production and get more power out of that plant, you can include those um, in the uh, <coughs> demonstration of compliance with this initiative. Now, is this an enforceable thing? Like, is there anything that's actually making people hit these numbers? Yes. Yeah. Yes, there is a, uh, it is enforceable. Um, Department of Commerce. Is it being enforced? It is being enforced uh, at PSC right now. 2010, we run our programs in two-year cycles. Mm -hmm. So 2010, 2011 was the first biennial cycle that we were under this uh, this law. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have third-party, uh, uh, we have a third-party review going on uh, that the commission mandated right now. And we have a filing due to the commission by June 1st based on the results of that third-party review saying yay or nay whether we met our conservation targets or not. And there's a fine of, I believe it's $50 for average megawatt that um, for us falling short of the conservation target. About the 15 or whatever the percentage is. Yeah, so that, that's the renewable. Uh, the other is all cost effective conservation. And this is something that's been kind of interesting too because you know, the law says all cost effective, but how do you define cost effective? That's a little bit different for each utility depending on what they're load mix is and um, generation mix. So there's been a lot of work done around determining how to, uh, how to comply with this law. Yes. So um, obviously, you know, the law states 15% from new. Um, does PSE have their own like higher goal or did this law kind of push you toward using or That's a good question. We've actually we've been we've been ahead of this goal, and it basically came out of you know us looking at the load growth, our forecast of load growth, and how to meet the, how to meet the needs. Right. And you're familiar with probably we have we have three major wind farms. Uh, we have Hopkins Ridge and Wild Horse. If you go over I-90, um, and then we have uh, Lower Snake River is the latest wind farm that's come online. And so we we had those under development before this law was in place. Right. So we've been positioned. <laughs> Uh, to comply with the 15% without... Uh, well, that's, what, that's where my thought comes from. I'm just wondering um, kind of why, and, and this is a different topic, so never mind, but I, in my own mind, I'm thinking, why is PSC's already doing this, so why did we kind of waste time maybe go? Are there lots of other companies? So, yeah, there are. are. So there are, there are about 17 utilities, I believe, that are oh, under okay. this law. So in the state of Washington, we have three investor-owned utilities. Uh, there's Puget Power, Puget Sound Energy, 
there's a, a Vista, which is in eastern Washington and southeast Washington. They're an electric and gas company as well. Uh, and there's Pacific Core, which is in southern Washington. So there are three investor-owned utilities that fall under this. And then there are a lot of uh, municipal and public utility districts as well. So maybe it wasn't so much to target PSC, but the smaller companies are. Um, yeah, really just it was a, you know, a target of statewide right. energy okay. efficiency and renewable initiatives. Okay, thank you. So this is how BSE takes a look at it. Uh, we do what's called the Integrated Resource Plan. Uh, the last one of these that we published was in 2011, and uh, we're, we're starting up uh, one right now that, we, we, that will be published in 2013. And just kind of wanted to show that we, we run a whole lot of scenarios. So we're kind of doing the same thing the Power and Conservation Council is doing. Um, and we look at uh, you know kind of base case, and then if there's low low growth in the region, kind of what we've been experiencing the last few years with economic conditions. Uh, you know we run models if it's a high low growth. Uh, you know natural gas prices. You've probably heard about shale gas and you know the new drilling technologies that allow us to get gas uh, more cheaper. So we kind of look at a low gas price and what if there's issues around that, which you've seen some of that in the news. You know what if there's a you know gas prices continue to, to go higher. What if there are some carbon uh, car carbon legislation requirements, uh, assigning more of a cost to, to carbon? And uh, then we do a kind of a green world, which really looks at uh, you know, high carbon prices, high gas prices, that would really push us to the maximum uh, renewable and energy efficiency uh, that we could do. And this is uh, this is what it looks like. We, we look out, you know, five years, ten years, twenty years, and this is this is what we need to do. To, to meet the low growth in the region. Basically, for any customer, when they flip the light switch, the lights will come on in their home. No? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the utilities are pretty invested in bulk generation and transmission, bulk transmission, and um, and we hear, we hear recently that Connecticut is going to microgrid to kind of maintain stability. And I'm wondering, are, is, I, I, I'm not sure how to phrase this delicately, I'm just, is there a bias against microgrids or is there a bias towards Bulk transmission solutions in your in your resource planning. I, um, I'd like to put that a little more gently. But yeah. yeah. No, I, I think it's, it's something we're embracing. And okay. it's, we have a new CEO, and that's something that you know, when you ask her what's the future of the electric grid, you know, she's like, 100 years from now, the the grid's gone, essentially from the model as it existed, you know, that's as, as it was built, and that you have very large central station power plants pushing power one way out to customers. You know, as we get more. Uh, Combined heat and power, micro turbines, solar PV, um, biomass uh, facilities. We have several dairy farms, the dairy digester farms that are putting power back onto the grid. It's becoming this two-way um, you know, system, and it's really, in some ways, it's becoming a battery. Is how you can look at it. Is you, know, you may be at work and everything's off in your home, and it's a sunny day. You're putting solar from your PV panels on your home. You're putting power into the battery. When you get home at night and it's dark and you need to do laundry and warm your house up and cook dinner, then you're pulling energy back out of the battery. So that, it really that's a, is. This is really good. Can I kind of follow up on that? Because I'm actually surprised by that answer, right? Because um, if you look at the if you look at the senior executive structure within the oil industry, they're pretty reactionary in terms of what they're advocating. I mean, they're technologically advanced, but they're they're kind of in the that dinosaur model, if you will. And yeah. sometimes utilities get kind of lumped in with that that. And with the idea that they're not really very forward thinking, and what I just heard you say is exactly the opposite, actually. Yeah, that they're yeah I think we are, PSE is, very, is, I think, very forward thinking on this. And one thing that you will find is um, if you look, we have a general rate case in right now. So we, we have to maintain pipes and wires and poles, and um, you know, there's a cost associated with that. And the more energy efficiency we do, and the more integrated we get with people selling to us through net metering. You, you get less and less of a revenue per kilowatt hour used or therm consumed by a customer. And we had in our, in our general rate case right now a conservation savings adjustment, a CSA, and really that's something that would help us be able to embrace this and go forward with it at a faster pace, is if we can get, you know, there's, there's that lost revenue associated with energy efficiency. And so we're being asked to comply with the law, which we do, it's, it's, it's our, strategy to keep power costs low and remain competitive, you know, long term. Um, but there is a loss margin associated with that. And that's something that we've been pursuing, working with the commission on, the other investor owned utilities are pursuing that as well. And I think, you know, there are gonna have to be some legislative changes and 
some structural changes in the way utility companies are, are regulated to really take the binders out and let this go go forward at a faster pace. Is there a tax rebate that you as a utility company get when you get people to try to create their own renewable energy to kind of balance that out? Because I mean, it's a loss for you, kind of as what you're saying. When they make that energy and they send it back to you, they're making money off of it, correct? Yeah, so there are, there are tax rebates and tax incentives for the customer. For installing um, for customer-owned generation uh, PV, you're kind of outside of my area of expertise, and so I, I don't want to give you an incorrect answer. I'm not aware of tax incentives there. We do get renewable energy credits from our wind farms, the utility-owned generation, and that's a straight pass-through uh, to our customers. So that's what we do with that that revenue. If you're a PSC Electric customer and you look on on your bill, you'll see a credit. Uh, which is basically the uh, the federal credits that we've received for renewable energy uh, production. And for residential, it's not really a thing, but let's say Google wanted to have a huge, um, you know, mega solar TV array on their data center or something. Is that more your niche, or is there like an industrial level rebates that you work with? Um, you know, whether it's industrial or, or small scale it residential, okay. it's it's basically set up with that within that structure of um, the net metering. So if you produce it, you know, we, we, put a, um, you know, we put a meter that spins both ways, which will reduce your bill if you're putting on the grid and um, increase your bill when you're pulling off the grid. And then there's also a production meter. So there's two meters on your system when you're doing solar PV and the other is, is the production meter. And that's basically allowing us to provide you know, tracking of how much renewable energy was produced and enable the payment of those tax credits for that renewable energy production. My understanding of those, just having done some research on my own, is that yes, those renewable energy credits that you would receive as a consumer when you sign up with PSC for their net metering, you, you turn those over to them. And so they receive the renewable energy credits that you would get. Kind of credit that you get. That's, it's in that contract. Yeah. Maybe we need to have all of our good power folks come and, and do a presentation. Too. Okay, yeah. We've got some folks that are very knowledgeable and can answer all the questions around the, around the solar piece. So this is, you know, I was talking earlier about that we, the utility companies have been doing energy efficiency since the 70s, and this is just a chart showing the cumulative energy savings uh, that we've accomplished in Puget Sound Energy through our efficiency programs that started in, uh, in 1978 time frame. Uh, it's been pretty aggressive, uh, you know, continually every year doing a little bit more. There was a, a bit of a plateau in the, in the late 90s, and this was just around uh, the deregulation that a lot of utilities started shifting to uh, um, you know, to basically prepare for, for a different type of operating environment. It's kind of interesting, that's I think one, this is where I uh, came to Washington from, from working for another utility. And I was on the unregulated side of a business that a utility was starting up uh, to prepare for deregulation. They wanted to go out and find other ways to, to make money. And we were doing turnkey energy services for customers. And uh, after the California energy crisis and other things that happened in early 2000, that uh, got turned around and the company sold off that part of the business. So I came to, to PSE to work on the regulated side of energy efficiency. Uh, in terms of AM, have you said adjusted megawatts? This is average megawatts. Yeah, so basically that will take your megawatt hours of savings and divide by 8760, 8760 okay. hours in a year. And uh, that, that's how we report that. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about um, you know, how, yeah, how, do, how do you do energy efficiency? And um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, very, uh, you know, very advanced uh, energy simulation models out there and a lot of very advanced analysis tools, um, but uh, you know, it's not really rocket science. There's a lot of com common sense can go a long way, and uh, I think one thing that took me a long time to learn when I got into the industry is you can dive into an Excel spreadsheet and start, you know, calculating a lot of things. Um, and some of it you can do on a post-it note and get just about as close of an answer. I think there's always that way of engineering and technological fields, but. Uh, I'm going to share with you a presentation I gave. It's getting kind of dated now. Uh, back in 2008 at the World Energy Engineering Congress, 
And then uh, another thing I want to point out to you are just some, some resources, online resources, uh, that have a lot of good materials, uh, good reference materials. And this is a, uh, I gave it a fancy title uh, to get my paper accepted for this conference, but uh, <laughs> called it Economical Load Disaggregation Strategies, but this is really just doing an energy audit from your desk is what this is about. And um, pretty much uh, he went into this talking about, you know, why do we conduct an energy audit? Pretty much that's the first thing you want to do when you're energy auditing is find out where's the, where's the energy going. You need to know what's consuming the energy before you can go figure out how much energy you can save from applying various uh, technologies within a facility. And um, the big part of that is uh, separating out energy use. Um, you have a meter on a building. You need to figure out how much energy is used by the lighting system, how much energy is used by plug loads, how much uh, energy is uh, being used to heat the building, to cool the building, um, and anything else that's going on in the building. And so you don't have to uh, dive into doing a full energy simulation model and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of metering, sub-metering, uh, right off the bat, if you want to just get some general information about the building. And um, so start with your bills. First thing you, you probably do when you when you're looking at uh, at utility bills, this is a uh, actually about a forty thousand square foot low density all electric office building in, in the Pacific Northwest. And if you plot usage over time or, or by month, the monthly bill, you'll see that um, in the in the summer months usage is going to be low, and in the winter months usage is going to go up. And that's primarily because you have to heat the building. Uh, we're heat. We're, we're a predominantly heating-dominated uh, uh, climate in the Northwest, and so we typically have the greatest energy use in a building in, in the wintertime. And so if you want to try and discern a little bit more about uh, energy use in the building, there's, uh, you, know, you, you can bring temperature into this. Sometimes this may be available on a utility bill each month, maybe an average temperature. Or um, you know, there's, there's plenty of weather, weather data sites available online. And you can start to see some trends. When the, when the temperature goes down, the energy use goes up. And it follows that trend uh, throughout the course of the billing cycle. But there's uh, a really useful technique that somebody showed me when I, when I first started at Puget um, to, to start to learn a little bit more about this. And that's to plot average, uh, plot your monthly usage. Um, you can add, can average it kilowatt hours per day since some billing cycles are different than others. They can average kilowatt hour per day of the energy use and uh, your average outdoor temperature during that month and you can see this trend start to develop. And you can see on the colder colder months you're using more for the heating. Uh, you kind of hit a minimum in the swing season, uh, spring and fall. And then in the summer, yeah, there's a little bit of cooling it looks like it's showing up here when you're running your air conditioning for the summer. And so you know that there's some loads in the building that are the same every day. You probably turn the lights on about the same time in the morning when people come into the building and turn them off about the same times in the evening uh, when people go home, et cetera. And then there's a weather dependent load. And so what you want to do when you're, when you're starting to analyze this building is think about how to break these out, figure out what's going on in the building. And the easy one to start with is, is lighting. You probably know about when the lights come on, when the lights go off. Talk to a facilities uh, manager or, or somebody that's, that's familiar with the building. Who's the first in in the morning? Who's the last out in the evening? Find out uh, you know, hours of operation for the lights, and uh, you can you, know, you, you can go around and maybe find a set of as-built drawings for the building and um, figure out your fixture wattages and figure out watts per square foot. And uh, pretty much here's the math to get there, what's per square foot, and how many square feet, and um, hours per day, and you can get your kilowatt hours per day. And then one thing that I always encourage people to do is you always, anytime you calculate this, you, you want to do a reality check. Anytime you come up with a number, think about, is, does this make sense? Is this reasonable? And so if we come up with a calculation here, and we're showing 3.9 kilowatt hours per, per square foot per year, let's go compare that to something. This is, uh, published typical lighting power densities um, out of an eliminating, eliminating Engineering Society of North America 
uh, publication. Like I said, this presentation is about four years old, so that link may no longer take you to exactly where you want to go. But this is average watts per square foot. So an office is showing uh, about you know one watt per square foot. And then um, here's older buildings. So if you're in a situation that looks more something like this, um, this is a uh, a study that was done in commercial buildings in 1986, and you can see lighting intensity was about, uh, well, this is six kilowatt hours per square foot per year. My units are shifting between these. Um, you know, but we, we came up with one watt per square foot. That agrees with uh, the newer office buildings. We see that uh, you know, we had about 3.9 kilowatt hours per square foot per year. Quite a bit less than this, but we're calling our office uh, a newer, more modern, newer, more modern office, you know, better technology. So we've got a pretty good handle on lighting use in the building. Uh, next thing, plug loads. And you can go around and, and do some, um, you know, the plug load monitors, watt stoppers, and measure out, and um, really do a very precise calc. Um, but, you know, maybe you want to just look for some resources. And this is a, uh, this was a study that Lawrence Berkeley National Lab did on basically the impact of plug loads in buildings. Space heaters, computers, cell phone chargers. And the study gave an example of, it gave some trends, typical data on how many kilowatt hours per square foot per year of the, the plug load exists in a building. So we're looking at an office building, and it's low density, less than 50 employees, so we'll just pick a number. Um, or uh, around two, two kilowatt hours per square foot. And we've got a little bit of exterior lighting on the uh, on the building as well, and so we can add that up pretty quickly. We come up with 1,400 watts of exterior lighting. Now you know it's going to burn longer in the winter than in the summer, and you, know, you, you can see that you know it's contributing maybe to a little bit of this peak over on the uh, the colder days because it's in the winter time and the, the nights are longer. But it's not that big of a big of a piece of, of total energy consumption. So we'll just go in. Uh, about 17 kilowatt hours a day and, and just spread that across the year. And then uh, domestic hot water is uh, kind of the same same thing we want to do there. Uh, we can get some information on typically how much gallon per person uh, per day and take building occupancy and, and come up with a number on that. Typically you're going to be heated out of your water heater or your tank at about 130. And your code requirements are about 110 is what you want with the, uh, the faucet. And then you have to come up with the, uh, you know, how much, what's the temperature of cold water coming into the building? And how much are you having to raise that, uh, raise that water temperature and then do the math on, on that to come up with uh, kilowatt hours per day of the energy used to heat your water. A really good uh, you know, estimate of cold water temperature coming into a building is, um, so this is average daily water use for our pool from in ASHRAE. And then a really good estimate for you know, cold water coming into a building, you can, you can just take groundwater temperatures. Usually if you have an energy simulation program, uh, the weather file will have average ground temperatures uh, throughout the course of the year, so you can use that. And I ran across this formula uh, when I was taking some building energy simulation training for eQuest, and uh, it seems to be a pretty good formula to use. So if you just take the mean monthly dry bulb temperature, average temperature for the month, uh, times that and add 30.4, 